Good morning, everyone. My name is Eva Cooper, and I'm pleased to have been asked to tell you my incredible story and miraculous story of survival during World War II. Martin, will you be able to show the slide, the photos as I go along? Yeah, which what's okay. going to happen is that you're, you're, I'm going to be blanking you out and they'll be able to see the, the PowerPoint. Okay, and there's going to be a part in the story where there are no photos, so then you can just put me back on and I'll tell you when, okay? Yeah. And I'll tell you when I need the first one. So if you could put on the first slide, it'll be an introduction to me. Okay, let me just go here. It's a portrait. No, no, that's not going to work. Screw this. If we have to go without the slides, we will. It's just that they do enhance okay. them. The first one's on. First one is on? Yeah. I don't see it. No, you won't see it. I see, but the students see it is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So would you move to, that's me on, on your screen, I guess. And yes. if you move to slide two, please. I'd like to tell you a little bit, just a little bit about my parents' lives as Jews before the war in Poland. They were born in a beautiful medieval town just south of Warsaw. It was called Sandomierz. The population of Sandomierz was largely Polish Catholic, as is the entire country even today, but close to 30% of the population of Sandomierz were Jewish, and they lived in relative harmony with their neighbors. Next slide, please. My parents were distantly related and they grew up in the same small apartment building and you see it, uh, let me see, what, let me look at my slide so that I can describe it to you, yeah. Uh, they lived in the same small apartment building. Here you have three slides, I believe that that's what you're looking at, yes, Martin? You got three slides. Yeah, good. So the one on the left will show you the town square and those of you who've been to some of the old cities in Europe, you'll know that most towns have a, a square in the city and all kinds of things happen there, festivities and markets and things like that. Against that building, which is the tower really, um, that tower is, is a place where there were many good things that were happening, but during the war, um, there were some very bad things that happened there. There were many people that were shot against the, the, the walls of that building. On the right side, the most right, you have an overview of the city of Sandomius, which is, as I said, a beautiful medieval town. It's built on a, on a hill. There's a cathedral on the hill and this photo is taken from that, from that place. The lower photo is a photo of the home, the building in which both my parents were raised, my mother's family in the right corner upstairs and my father's family in the back. back. As I said, they were distantly related and they grew up in that, in that small apartment building together. My father was the oldest of six siblings and my mother was the oldest of five. My father, being a good student, was very interested in attending university and studying engineering. His special interest was to work in the processing of furs, which were a very big industry at the time. As a Jew, he was not admitted to university as it was extremely difficult, almost impossible, for a Jewish student to be attending. And if you think that this is uh, weird and odd and strange, it, it really was not strange. Almost in, in many places of the world this happened and happened in Canada. Um, in fact, it wasn't until, the 19, until 1960 that McGill lifted its quota on Jewish students for medical school. Out of 120 students admitted per year, there was a quota of only 10 Jewish students until 1960 when they broke the quota and, and admitted 20. So, and, and there were places in the Laurentians and in Montreal where Jews could not buy property, they could not buy vacation property, they could not go to certain hotels. So as, as horrible as that sounds to us today, um, anti-Semitism and um, um, differing of, of uh, Jews as people uh, was not uncommon all over the world, even in our wonderful country. My grandparents struggled to provide my father with the possibility of attending university, and he was sent to Liège, another beautiful town, medieval town in Belgium this time, to get his engineering degree. Upon graduation, he returned to Sandomierz, and my parents married and moved to Warsaw, where my father found a good job and they moved into a lovely apartment. We begin now. 
Oh, we missed one slide, didn't we? Uh, could you sh uh, show slide four, please, Martin? Okay. Here's the family. This is my, as I told you, they were distantly related, and this is a combined picture of both families, of some members of both families. My father is the one on the uh, in the in the top row on the on the left. Um, my mother is at his elbow in the second row, and beside her is a woman who is a cousin, first cousin of my mother's, and also her closest friend. Her name is Regina Banker, and please try to remember about her because she features very importantly in this story. Um, in fact, if not for her, I wouldn't be here telling you this story. Uh, in front row, you see two younger women. One is, uh, the one on the left is my father's sister, Sophie. She's also in the story. And the reason I have these photos and other photos that you'll see is because of the other one, whose name is Gertrude Lucy, and she is my mother's younger sister. They were the same age and they were very good friends. So we begin now at one of the most ominous times and places in modern history, Warsaw, Poland, 1939. Can we show the next slide, please? I have often wondered why my parents, Abram and Fela Kupferblum, both educated and worldly, would decide to bring a child into the world knowing what they must have known. And you see a photo here of my father and my mother with me as a baby. Next slide, please. In this slide, you see my Aunt Sophie. She's one of the young girls in front, the one that was on the left, with me in Sandomierz. And this is probably just at the outbreak of the war, or just after the outbreak of the war, because I wasn't born until 1940. But this was my last visit to Sandomierz, probably the last time that I ever saw my grandparents, because they were, they were killed during the war. And uh, Sophie brought me there to see her parents and, and, and my mother's parents. So were my parents simply being human in their optimism and desire to have a normal, fulfilled life? Since 1933, when Hitler came into power in Germany, the winds of war had been blowing in Europe. Did my parents not believe, not trust, that what Hitler had promised in his book, Mein Kampf, would spread to the entire continent of Europe. By the time I was born in February 1940 in Warsaw, the die was cast and soon Poland and her neighbors were engulfed in one of the most horrific periods in human history. And we're seeing so many echoes of that today from Ukraine. Never before had a government designated a systematic and terrifying plan to eradicate a people from the face of the earth. And it was not only the Jews, but the Roma, the disabled, homosexuals, political opponents, all judged to be subhuman. The Aryan race, typically Gentile, of Nordic appearance, tall, blonde, blue-eyed, looking Germanic, was held to be the ideal. This has always presented a dilemma for me. I assume that many of you have seen photos of Hitler and heard his masterful oratory as he addressed masses of his ardent followers. Was Hitler of the Aryan race? Short, dark hair? He would not have looked out of place in any one of the selection lines in his concentration camps. Yet this comparison is never made. There were 3.5 million Jewish people in Poland before the war, 3.5 million the largest population in all of Europe. Two thirds of that number were murdered in the course of the war. Soon after conquering Poland, the Nazis proceeded to segregate the Jews into ghettos, areas separated from the rest of the town or city, surrounded by high walls, often with electrified wire on top. The largest of these ghettos in Poland, of which there were many, was in Warsaw. Next slide, please. Yep. Roughly in 30 square blocks, occupied before the war by 30 to 40,000 people, they amassed a population of over 400,000 Jewish people who were forced to live in subhuman conditions. It was not unusual to have five to eight people in a single room, not in a home 
not an apartment, in a room. They were forced to work as slave laborers, were deprived of food, of space, of freedom, while being tortured and abused by their captors. The infrastructure, such as the sewage disposal system and the potable water supply engineered to provide for the needs of 30 to 40,000 people could not cope with the 400, over 400,000. Overflowing human waste ran freely in the streets before too long. And here you see a picture of the ghetto wall with the ghetto on one side and what was known as free Warsaw. Of course, free Warsaw wasn't free because the Nazis occupied all of Poland and many Poles suffered during the war as well. Practically everyone. The country was at war and you see what a country at war looks like just by looking at the news every day. Next slide, please. People rapidly began to die of diseases caused by the unbearable condition, tuberculosis, dysentery, typhoid fever, cholera, rats, lice, and vermin of all sorts contributed to the spreading of the infestation. There was not a family who had not suffered the loss of a loved one on almost or more than one loved one, almost on a daily basis. And you see here two photos showing you conditions in the Warsaw Ghetto. They're unbearable conditions. You see children dressed in rags with not proper attire. And Poland's climate is very similar to ours, so you can imagine spending a winter in this condition. Meantime, the Nazis were preparing their killing camps. The closest of those to Warsaw was Treblinka, the infamous camp which was designed specifically for the efficient murder, mass murder, of human beings. Even the Nazis, well known for their meticulous bookkeeping, did not list the names of their victims. There were simply too many. In their devious wisdom, the Nazis had established a Jewish government of sorts in the ghetto, made up of Jewish community leaders from before the war. This was called the Judenrat, and it was charged with carrying out the orders of the Nazis. This council had no power whatsoever. But the Nazis had calculated correctly that if their orders came from other Jews, the population of the ghetto would be less likely to resist. Next slide, please. One day in 1942, when I was two years old, my mother and I, along with hundreds of other women and children, were herded to Umschlagplatz in the Warsaw Ghetto for what the Nazis euphemistically called resettlement. This was the place where the train tracks ran along the ghetto border. Now you see here uh, people being herded towards Umschlagplatz, the place where the, where the, where the uh, railway line ran right along the border. A cousin of my mother's, Regina Banker, do you remember her? I mentioned her in the first photo, who was forced to work as a prison guard in the ghetto She was in jail, actually. She was, she was working as a prison guard in the Warsaw Ghetto in, jail, in the jail that they had established there. She rushed to the loading platform upon hearing that we had been rounded up. Next slide, please. She arrived there just in time to see my mother carrying me in her arms. And you see a scene here in the two pictures that you're looking at. You see the cattle cars lined up and people being pushed into them. She arrived there just in time to see my mother holding me in her arms, being forced into one of the long line of cattle cars waiting to be loaded. She ran to that cattle car screaming at the top of her lungs that I was her child and that my mother was just minding me. For some unfathomable reason, my mother was permitted to pass me hand to hand, hand to hand, until I was literally thrown off that cattle car into Regina's arms. The doors of the cattle cars slammed shut and eventually that train pulled away. That was the last time anyone saw my mother or any of the hundreds and hundreds of other women and children on that and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other trains like it. 
Next slide, please. Okay. She was murdered, along with countless others, within one hour of her arrival at Treblinka, where over 900,000 people were murdered in just over 16 months. I was two years old. And here you have a map of where Treblinka's relation to Warsaw is very close, as you see, just a little bit north. Next slide, please. Regina's amazing courage at this moment and the choice she made against all odds, which could easily have led to her own instant death, gives me pause to this day. Only as a mature adult did I truly understand the unimaginable decisions made by Regina and by my mother. To pass a beloved child off forever in order to take the infinitesimal chance that she could be saved from certain death, a choice so unnatural to a mother whose every instinct screams out to hold her child close, to protect her with her own life if needed. A choice unbelievably heroic and prescient under the circumstances. There'll be no slide now for a little while if you want to just, um, you can put me on the screen if you like so that the students can see my face. And I okay. don't know if I can, see, can I see them? No. No. <laughs> Every day, the Nazis issued edicts, ordering hundreds of people to be rounded up and herded to Umschlagplatz for resettlement. This is still in the ghetto. People were caught in the street, and if the numbers were not sufficient, houses were searched and the occupants were dragged out. When such an order was given, people scattered like rats, desperately searching for a place to hide, a cellar, an attic, a hole, any place. My father, carrying me in his arms, was just in such a position one day and was fortunate enough to find a cellar partially flooded and already full of terrified people in which to hide while the roundup was taking place. The people who had preceded us into that cellar protested when they saw my father carrying a young child. They were rightfully worried that a child would cry or call out and cause all to be lost. My father assured them that he would hold me close. And if he felt me making any sound, he would suffocate me himself. Can you imagine this level of despair? I was a child of war. As a young child, I know that I had no clear understanding of the tragic circumstances and events of our life at the time. But a child does understand anxiety, fear, terror. I had learned to do what I was told. I must have felt the urgency, the need to comply as our very lives depended on it. We survived that night, but it was inevitable that we would be caught, if not this time, then next. My father told me many years later that he always carried two cyanide pills in his pocket. It's a very powerful poison and that he was fully prepared to give one to me and to take the other himself. He was that determined not to allow the Nazis to capture us alive. My father made a terrifying decision to attempt to escape from the ghetto where life had become simply unendurable. The ghetto, as you might know, was enclosed, as I told you before, with a 10 foot high brick wall topped by electrified barbed wire. Many had tried to escape, some even by climbing the walls in desperation. Few succeeded. The one very narrow possibility was escape through the sewers. If undetected and undenounced, one could enter the sewer within the ghetto walls and walk in the sewer to exit outside the borders of the ghetto. As you can imagine, this was a very risky strategy. People were starving, people were dying. And if someone saw you entering the sewer, even a fellow Jewish ghetto inmate, and reported you to the authorities in exchange for some bread to keep their family alive for another day. 
that you were instantly killed. We are so fortunate to live in this country, Canada, the best country in the world, that we cannot even imagine that someone could do such a thing. But we must not be too quick to judge, as truly we don't know how we ourselves would behave in similar circumstances. Hopefully we'll never know. The picture you were looking at before was a picture of my mother and Regina. I forgot to mention that to you because that's a, the best picture that I have of both of them. My mother's the one with the barrette, Regina is below her. My father arranged with his sister, Sophie, that's the young girl that you saw before, and that was in San Domingue with me, who, who lived outside the ghetto using what was called Aryan papers, that is false identity papers, passing as a Christian. She, he arranged with her to have someone pick us up when we emerged from the sewer. On a dark night, my father carrying me, entered the sewer undetected. He told me many years later that the distance we had to walk would perhaps take 20 minutes if you were walking in the street. Inside the sewer, filled, as I described, with human excrement reaching above his waist, the journey took over two hours. You can imagine how we felt, looked and smelled when we exited. We waited anxiously for the man who was to pick us up. When he finally arrived, he took us to the home of my father's friends from before the war. Their name was Rondio. They were horrified when they saw us, but they invited us in, allowed us to bathe, fed us, and assured us that we could stay with them as long as needed. Of course, this was not possible. It was absolutely forbidden for by Nazi law to assist a Jewish person or family in any way. We were truly endangering the lives of the Rondios by being in their home. I knew my father for all of the many years of our life together to be a very honest man. But those years called for remarkable resources and strategies in order to maximize your chances of survival. In the ghetto, my father worked as a slave laborer, as a chemist, in a fur processing plant operated by the Nazis. In order to enable him to have some money, my father would wear two pairs of pants when going to work. He would tie a string at the ankle, at each ankle of the pants closest to his body. And when he was working with the skins, he would from time to time slip one into one leg or the other. In that way, he accumulated some cash and he sold these skins on the black market, which was still possible during the first years of the ghetto. This enabled him to leave the ghetto prepared for the task that he had set for himself. He was determined that once out of the ghetto, he would devote all his resources to ensuring the safety of family members whom he knew were in hiding. This was of course very hazardous as raids took place in different sectors of the city and neighbors denounced anyone they suspected of hiding Jews. If discovered, not only were the Jewish people killed, but so too were the people who were helping. In fact, whole villages were sometimes burned to the ground because one farmer was hiding someone in his barn. My father knew that he would need to be vigilant and to learn whatever he could about raids in certain neighborhoods keeping his ears and eyes open for possible hiding places to which he could move relatives if their current hiding places became too dangerous. It was obvious too that my father could not devote himself to helping family members in hiding while caring for a two-year-old child. He was able to purchase Ford's identity papers under the Polish name of Anthony Kornatsky, enabling him to pass as a Gentile. He then engaged the help of a friend Dr. Lander, the pediatrician who had looked after me from the time of my birth, who promised to find a place of relative safety for me. Dr. Landy took me to the home of a remarkable woman of uncommon goodness. Her name was Hanka Rembowska, and she agreed to take me at enormous risk to her own life. She looked after me for several months until she was no longer able to do so because of her own deteriorating health. She was suffering from tuberculosis. She was very ill. This disease destroys the lungs 
And it was deadly at the time because it was before antibiotics or just at the outset of antibiotics, certainly not available in the ghetto and during the war. While walking with me one day and desperately looking for a new place for me, she came upon a small group of nuns waiting at a train station. Hanka vaguely knew one of the nuns. She pleaded with the nun to take her little girl since she knew that this order of nuns was already looking after a number of blind children. The nun reluctantly agreed and I remained with the nuns until the end of the war in 1945. When the war ended, people began to come out of hiding. Camp survivors and those who had somehow found shelter were desperately looking for any small remnants of their family, their friends, their neighbors, anything. Organizations such as the Red Cross and others were set up to help people connect with one another. Long lists of names of people who had registered with these organizations were routinely read on the radio and thick lists of names were attached to the remnants of buildings and lampposts because 85% of Warsaw had been reduced to rubble by the bombings. And these scenes are very familiar to us today when we look at the cities in Ukraine. People lined up for blocks in order to search these lists for a familiar name. It was in just such a way that my aunt Sophie, my father's sister, found my name. She did not tell my father in fear that it might not really be me. I have a vague memory of her coming to claim me, telling me that she was my aunt and that she was going to take me to my daddy. As a child of war, I left all that was familiar with the nuns and went with this total stranger, for I did not remember my aunt, who took me to my father. I always found it curious that I do not remember my reunion with him either. But why would I? I had not seen him in over three years and I was less than three when we parted. Next slide, please. After the war, we lived in Poland in a city called Bielsko, and you see a picture here of my father, my aunt Sophie, and me. Right after the war, I would say probably would be 1946. My aunt lived with us because she had, her husband had been murdered during the war as well. So after the war, we lived in Poland as non-Jews. Non-Jews, in spite of all the tragic events which had been perpetrated on us by the Nazis, it was still not safe to live openly as a Jew in post-war Poland. In fact, there were several pogroms or raids even after the war during which people were killed. We, in all probability, would not have been killed but my father would not have been appointed as director of a food processing plant, this time operated by the, by the Soviets, by the Russians, who liberated Poland in 1945, but basically forgot to go home until 1989. And during all that time, Poland was behind the Iron Curtain and really out of touch with the Western world. I would not have been able, we would not have been able to live in our lovely apartment and I would have been tormented at school. So it was better for me not to know. Next slide, please. As I told you before, Poland is a Catholic country. And I went to a state school, which was a Catholic school. I studied catechism. I had my first communion at the age of six. And you see proof of that here as you look at the picture. You see me and my little friend, Hanya. And um, we both have garlands of uh, lilies of the valley in our hair and our white dresses. And beside it, you see my certificate of acknowledgement that I did have my first communion at the age of six. And I was well indoctrinated in the fine art of anti-Semitism. I went to church with our housekeeper each Sunday and loved the splendor, the stained glass, the majesty of the church. I urged my father to come with me. He never would, telling me that he does not go to church, but that God is everywhere and that he can pray at home. My teacher was often warning us at dismissal to go straight home and not to talk to strangers, especially, she said, not the Jews, who we were told were bad people. They had killed Christ and done other terrible things. I was an obedient child. I loved school and I loved my teacher. Why would I not believe her? Especially since I had no idea what a Jew was, not knowing any. 
And of course, I had no way of knowing that what she was saying was not true. It was the Romans who killed Christ. And all the, uh, and the other anti-Semitic tribes are also not, uh, are not true. They're not based on truth. They're not based on fact. They're based on, anti on racism, really, on, 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 on anti-Semitism. My father remarried in 1947. And in December of 1948, we emigrated to Canada where we had family who settled there before the war. The trip was terrible and I would not re recommend crossing the North Atlantic in December. The winds were fierce and the waves were enormous making the ship rock furiously. I was sick as a dog through the whole trip and was on that ship, the Stefan Vatori, which brought over many immigrants to Canada and to the United States. It was on that ship that my father told me, as gently as he knew how, that we were Jewish. I was appalled. I was a Catholic child who prayed, who attended church, had her first communion, went to confession. It could not be true. It took me many years to become comfortable with my Jewish identity and to take a rightful pride in the history and contributions of my people Identity is set early in life, and it is a wrenching experience to learn that you are not who you believed yourself to be. And don't forget, I was an eight-year-old child. It happened many, many times over in Poland to adults who thought that they were Catholic, but who had been taken in by Catholic families, and they were in fact Jewish children. And when they found out what their actual um, religion uh, people were, uh, this was a terribly wrenching experience, and to this day, there are groups, support groups run for, for people who have found their identity later in life. I grew up in Montreal, and the Holocaust was ever present in our family's life, although my father and my stepmother talked very little about it to me. Uh, they were trying to protect me, I believe, and regrettably, I did not ask. Most of their friends were survivors as well. And it was during these times together that their experiences during the Holocaust were discussed. I had little interest as I wanted to be a Canadian kid, just like my friend, and was not curious about our history. I'm dreadfully sorry today they asked, that I asked my father so little about my mother and about his experiences and feel deeply that until my mature years, I had not paid enough honor to her heroism and to her memory. As an adult, even, I have not been interested in returning to Poland to explore our family history. But my younger daughter, Felisa, who was named for my mother, whose name was Fela, had a compelling interest in the Holocaust and its effects on our family. All my kids read about the Holocaust, books that were appropriate for whatever age they were, but she just devoured them. She was curious always about the Holocaust. Next slide, please. She urged me to return to Poland with her. And in 2005, as I prepared for the trip, I researched online for convents in the south of Poland where I knew that I had been hidden. I found one which had looked after children during the war and made an appointment to visit with Felisa. You're looking now at two photos. The one on the left is one of the two places in Warsaw today that you can see the remnants of the actual ghetto wall. And you see that it's been repaired, very poorly repaired, but has been repaired many, many times over. That's the one on the left that has all kinds of plaques on it. And on the right, you see what Umschlagplatz looks like today. This is the place where the train tracks came to the border of the ghetto. And you saw a picture of how it looked when people were being loaded onto cars, onto the uh, cattle cars. This is what it looks like today. It's a marble um, memorial and the wall on the right is entirely covered with names of people. And the names are just first names, given names. So it could be Eva, it could be Marlene, it could be Mark, it could be George, it could be Hein, it could be many, many first names. And for each one of those first names, there could be hundreds of people bearing that name. There simply was not enough room on that wall for all those names. It's a very moving place. And when I travel to Poland with groups of adults or students, this is where I tell my story. It's a very significant place for, in my story. 
My friend had also given me the name of an American genealogist whose name is Yale Reisner before I went to Poland, who lived in Warsaw and who she said would be able to help me. I did not really feel that I would need his help, but I was quite sure because I was quite sure that I'd found the right content online. But when we arrived in Warsaw, I decided to call Yale and we went to meet him in his office at the Jewish Historical Institute. He had warned me that he had a very busy day and that we might have to wait. So while we waited, we explored a photo exhibit and film documenting life in the Warsaw Ghetto. The photos, taken by Nazi officers for their own amusement, were the most graphic images I had ever seen of life in the ghetto. They, along with the film, were extremely difficult to witness. I felt submerged in that time and place, very dark, very painful. When I looked at my watch, I realized that we had waited for four hours with no sign of Yale. I'm not the kind of person who waits patiently for four hours, especially since I was not convinced that I needed his help. I phoned him to say that we could wait no longer and that we were with regret leaving. He begged us to stay and assured us that he was almost done with the family who was there to see him from Israel and was almost ready to see us. It was uncharacteristic of me to agree but something prevented me from leaving. When I finally began to tell him my story about being a hidden child in a convent for blind children in the south of Poland, he dashed to his bookcase and from about a thousand books, he extracted one which documented convents which had been instrumental in saving Jewish children during the war. This book, whose English title is Your Life is Worth Mine, is actually a PhD thesis written by a woman whose name is Eva Korek. It is written in the format of short paragraphs which list the convents, their names and locations, and the number of children each saved. Flipping the pages furiously, Yale came upon a passage which he read aloud in Polish. Congregation of Franciscan sisters, the servants of the cross, a Polish order established in 1918 for the purpose of caring for and educating the blind. In 1939, 106 nuns worked in 18 homes in Zakopane, which is in the south of Poland. Sister Clara Jaroszynska saved the life of one Jewish little girl. We were speechless. This was had to be the right convent. And this Jewish little girl had to be me. Yale wrote down the contact number of the convent and handed it to me. After some problems, I succeeded in reaching a nun at the convent to whom I explained who I was and the purpose of my call. She was very excited and invited us to visit. Hesitantly, I asked if someone who might have been there with me during the war could possibly be still alive at that time, it was 60 years later. Incredibly, the sister told me that Sister Clara Yaroshinska, the name which Yale had cited in the book, was still alive. Next slide, please. She was now 94 years old. She assured me that Sister Clara, who was herself blind for the last five years, was otherwise intact with an excellent memory and a great sense of humor. We were beyond excited. And on the way to Lasky, which is where the, the uh, order now has their, their uh, school, we picked up a huge bouquet of roses, wanting to bring something beautiful, which Sister Clara could enjoy despite her lack of vision. We arrived in Lasky, where the op order operates an institute for the blind in which the nuns care for and educate over 300 blind and some deaf children, ranging in age from three to 19, today, as they did before the war. As I mentioned, Warsaw was virtually destroyed during the war. And Maskey being very close to Warsaw, 15 kilometers in fact, was also, was also heavily bombed. And the nuns, afraid for their lives and the lives of their children, divided their charges into smaller groups and along with a few nuns, sent each group to a safer rural area to maximize their chance of survival. This is how I landed up in the south of Poland, near Zakopane in a village called Bukovina. Next slide, please. 
We were taken to the house where the older nuns lived and Sister Clara emerged supported on each side by a younger nun. When she was told that we had arrived, she smiled broadly and immediately spread her arms out in welcome. I flew into them. You must remember that I was very young during the war. I had absolutely no memory of her, not her face, not her voice, nothing. Yet when I was in her arms and we were holding each other and crying, I felt like I had come home. A very strong connection difficult to explain. I call it emotional memory. Somewhere in my being, I had stored the memory of this incredible woman and her loving presence in my young life at a time that I most needed it. It was extremely moving. We sat together and shared memories. She told me that she had fallen in love with me, a tiny child with bright dark eyes and an engaging manner. When she met Hanka Lembowska, who begged her to take me, I apparently ran to her and put my arms around her knees, probably as high as I could reach. And looking up at her face, I said, please pick me up. She felt that God had sent me to her and that she had no choice but to risk her life and the lives of all who were with her during the war by taking me. It was, she said, what she had been taught, the right, the moral thing to do. It is from the time that I spent with Sister Clara that my own memories surface. I remember that we had very little food and were often hungry. Our diet consisted of whatever the nuns had been able to beg from the farmers around us, potatoes, carrots, onions. I remember sitting in a circle outside with the other children, all of them boys, all of them blind, with a bag of potatoes in the middle of the circle. The boys would peel the potatoes and pass them to me, the only sighted child, to inspect. I would remove whatever peel was left and throw the potato into the big pot of water in the middle of the circle. That would be our dinner. Another memory has to do with one cow, the one cow that we had. The cow grazed in the pasture all day, and I, as a sighted child, would be sent to bring her back to our farmhouse for milking in the evening. And we're not seeing each other because I'm doing this presentation virtually, but I'm not very tall. In fact, I'm four foot 10. And when I was this age, when I was three years old, I looked like a child less than two. So you can just imagine a child of that size being sent to get a cow, which is an enormous animal in comparison. I have always loved animals and I love this time of the day when holding the heavy rope around her neck, I would walk back to our house singing and patting the cow's neck. I also remember that the Nazis would appear from time to time, heading for the village near our farmhouse. When that happened, someone from the village would run up to alert us that the Nazis were nearby. They came to replenish their supplies, their food supplies, and basically took whatever they wanted. No one except the nuns and the priest who was with us knew that the nuns were hiding a Jewish child. But it was important for the nuns to know when the Nazis were near so that they could hide whatever they might have come, whatever might be, whatever they thought might be confiscated. I'm not sure how one can hide a cow, but somehow they managed because we, we kept the cow throughout the war. Of course, the first thing that they hid was me. A small hole was excavated in the earthen floor of the cellar of the farmhouse. And I would be told to scrunch up as small as possible and to get into that hole. The opening was then covered with a board, a mat, and a small table was placed on top. I was told that I had to remain absolutely still and silent. Again, as a child of war, I did as I was told. Curiously, I don't remember being frightened to be placed in such a grave-like hole in the earth. I must have trust in the nun, must have had trust in the nuns that they would not make me do something which would harm me. I find this amazing. Some of you may know three-year-olds, four-year-olds, or even five-year-olds, and know what an impossible task that would be. Sister Clara died in 2010 at the age of 99, but we had the last five years of her life to strengthen our relationship. I spoke to her often on the phone and saw her three more times, excuse me. I'm so, I'm so I 
I spoke to her often on the phone and saw her three more times before her death. Next slide, please. I visited her with my other daughter, Debbie, and her family, accompanied by various cousins in 2007 and again in 2009, when a German filmmaker named Kirsten Esch included this story in her excellent film, documenting the stories of three hidden children. And in fact, Vanier has that film because I've shown it at Vanier in past years. Sister Clara appeared in the film, but her mind by then was not quite as bright as it had been even a year before. The last time we saw one another was when I visited her accompanied by two of my closest friends after traveling to Berlin for a screening of the film, Hidden Children, Unknown Heroes at the Jewish Museum in Berlin. Imagine a film about Jewish children saved by righteous Gentiles and made by a German filmmaker being screened in Berlin, Hitler city, it was very powerful. Sister Clara, along with her actual sister and parents, saved other Jewish people during the war. She and her parents are listed as righteous among the nations at Yad Vashem. Israel became a state in 1948, and it was shortly after that time, in 1953, in fact, that Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Israel, was established. At the same time, Israel created the designation Righteous Among the Nations to honor and pay tribute to righteous Gentiles who had been instrumental in saving Jewish lives during World War II. Next slide, please. My reunion with Sister Clara in 2005 profoundly changed my life. It made me acutely aware of the two precious gifts she had given me. Not only had she given me the gift of saving my life, as if that were not enough, but she also gave me the gift of love. She made it possible for me to become the person I am today, a person who loves her family, her friends, her community, and who finds pleasure and sustenance through connections with others and through giving back to society. After a lifetime of work in the field of education and educational administration, I retired in 2005 and have devoted myself to volunteer work, all of it important, but my major mission has been Holocaust education. Last slide, please. Once again, the ugly specter of anti-Semitism is on the rise, regardless of our vows of never again. Continuing violence, genocide, and ethnic cleansing, hordes of refugees desperately seeking safety, war, intolerance, and racism threaten our world. I share my story as I'm doing with you today, believing that it will enable my audiences to remember, to understand our history with the hope, however slim, that we can together create a world in which all that we have in common as human beings will be more important and binding than the differences which tear us apart. Thank you for listening and thank you for your interest. I would be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. If not, I have a couple of just very brief comments. Okay, thank you very much. I'll ask, uh, does anybody have any questions about her experience? Nobody. Oh, yeah. One one person was wondering when you were born. You were where were you born? You weren't born in the ghetto, were you? No, I was born in Warsaw, and the ghetto was established very soon after my birth. We saw that photograph of the, of the apartment building that she lived in as a child. No, no, no. That was the apartment building that my father and mother lived in. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, one uh, student wants to know, while you were the, the nuns in the convent or the school, what was your father doing in those, those years? 
as I said, my father was very busy trying to protect the hiding places of people in our family who were hidden. So he would, he would, uh, you know, he'd collected some money, as I said, in the in the Warsaw ghetto, and he would have to pay people to hide family members. He'd have to move them from place to place when areas in which they were hidden were um, um, were were being raided, or where he heard that there might be some kind of a raid. He'd move them to another place, which he tried very hard to find in advance, so that he would be ready when he had to move them. Between him and one cousin, whose name was Irena Zoberman. He and my, fa my father and, and Irena saved everyone in our family who was in hiding. And that many, 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 many of the cousins and, and their siblings were lost but, um, or were murdered. I, I don't even like to say lost because what happened to them is that they were murdered. Um, but the ones that were saved, many of them were saved because of the efforts of my father and Irena over. So he had uh, the identity papers for a Gentile for being yes. Christian, and that's yes. why, he, yes. as a Pole. Yes. So that way he was able to move around. How did he survive? I mean, did he, how did he, did he work at all or? Uh, you know, I don't know his story, which is interesting because he never actually told me his story. And when I would ask him, and I asked very little, but the odd time that I would ask him something, in recalling anything, he would then have nightmares. And I often was, was um, I'd like to tell you that I was such a good daughter that I didn't really want to disturb his sleep or to make him uncomfortable. But the fact was I wasn't very curious and I'm very sorry. In fact, the reason that I have the early part of the story, most of the story is what he told me. And he told this to me about six months before he died and I taped it on an audio tape. You might remember the audio tape, I'm sure the students don't. <laughs> and, um, and I had, um, I had this audio tape and it was several years. He died in 1987 and it was several years after that that I had the courage to listen to it and, and sort of piece together my story. And then of course it was augmented by my findings in 2005 when we found Sister Clara. Great. Okay, I'll ask anybody else have any questions. Taha? Uh, what was the experiences that she said, like, she remembers that? The, the question is, the memories that you have, I would presume would be about the convent and not so much about the ghetto that the... I have no memory. I have no memory of the ghetto. No memory at all. I have no memory uh, until I was with Sister Clara and probably not from the first years that I was with her because most of us don't have personal memories before the age of four, the earliest, maybe five. So my memories are from the time that I was hidden and I was not in a convent, I was in a farmhouse because the convent was abandoned because of the bombing. And it wasn't really a convent, it was an institute for the blind. These nuns did not live in a convent, they lived in this institute. And they, have, they had outposts like that all over the world. And they had two or three in Africa, in fact, even today, the same nuns. We don't see nuns in Canada so much because they're dressed like everybody else in a sort of uniform. Usually it's a gray skirt and a white blouse and whatever jacket. But um, in Poland, the nuns are still dressed in the habit, in the traditional habit that you saw in the photographs of Sister Clara. For the Franciscan sisters, other orders of nuns have different uniforms. Right. So in a way, your, your memories, early memories or secondhand memories that you heard from your your father from your uncle or your cousin. Exactly, exactly. Any other questions? I have a couple of very short remarks to make if there's no more questions, but I'm happy to answer any questions that are left. Oh, we have another question. Okay. Uh, has, like, has Uh, the question is, having to come to terms with your own past, have you come to terms with what happened to you as a child, what happened to your family? I don't know what that means, come to terms with. It's certainly a part of who I am. It certainly has, has scarred me and it probably scarred my children to some extent. You know, there is the inadvertent passage of trauma from one generation to the other. In fact, part of this um, uh, seminar uh, that Vanya is running this week 
there'll be a person, um, a psychiatrist whose name is Robert Krell, who's done a great deal of work on the inadvertent transmission of trauma from one generation to the other. And in fact, it happened in my own family and that my daughter Felisa, is the one who was so interested in the Holocaust, um, used to have memories, used to have dreams of being chased, of fires, of danger, and this was not her history, and it was it was it was my history, but not my recollection. And yet somehow it's it 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 happened, and she she was plagued by these memories, and I didn't know about it until we'd gone to Poland together. And um, it was interesting because once once we came back from Poland, and I started to do serious work in in Holocaust education, which I do through the Montreal Holocaust Museum, where I'm very involved on several levels. Um, I kind of picked up that burden for our family and she stopped having that, the memories. She stopped having the dreams, which was very interesting. How did you feel when your father told you on the boat coming over that you weren't a Catholic girl, but you were actually Jewish? I was horrified because what I knew about the Jews, I didn't know any Jews, but what I knew was what I had been told. And anti-Semitism was rampant in Poland. Um, I haven't found it rampant when I went back. I've been back to Poland about eight or nine times now with various groups and sometimes with my own family. Um, but my, my family who doesn't speak Polish um, feel it. I, I don't feel it when I'm there because I speak the language and I found people to be very helpful. And, um, but, but there is anti-Semitism in every country, including in our country. So how did I feel? I was appalled. I was horrified. I did not want to be one of them because of what I knew about them was not good. So obviously, one of the messages I have for the students is one that deals with personal responsibility. Because no matter how young they are, and they are sort of older teenagers at this point, and maybe some even older than that, we've all seen injustice in our own lives. Even if we're young, when I speak to grade six children who are 12, um, I, I, I leave them with a similar message. Whether you've seen injustice in your own family or on the metro or in school or in a schoolyard or in any situation, social or otherwise, you've seen people victimized, you've seen people bullied, um, and, and maybe you've stood by. Um, and, and that is my message to you today because I'm going to quote Elie Wiesel, and I'm sure that you know who he is, and if you don't, then maybe you could tell them. Um, he said that silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Action is the only remedy to indifference. The most insidious danger of all is indifference. And, and of course, I wouldn't ask you ever to risk your own life, but I would ask you to get help, to do something to help whoever is being victimized. And now that you've heard my story, I'm, I'm counting on you to be a witness in the face of Holocaust denial, because you are the last generation of young people to actually meet and directly hear the story of a Holocaust survivor. So you will know when people deny the Holocaust that they're wrong, that it did happen. Believe me, I could not have made it up. And we see that it's possible when we look at the news every day now. What's happening in Ukraine? What happened in Bucha? Which is, which is just yesterday's news. It's, 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 it's genocide on a huge scale. It's not organized the way the Nazis did. It seems to be much more random, but very, very, very profound genocide for sure. Okay, uh, I know we have another question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what, what student is curious about, uh, Eddie, do you still have any sort of Catholic connection? Do you still sort of maybe go to church or, you know, or remember the prayers? Uh, I remember some of the prayers. I remember all of the hymns because they won't remember this. You might. But when I went to the Protestant school board here in Montreal as a child, um, after coming to Canada, we were taught all the hymns. But I remember, I remember going to church and I remember the, be the beauty and the majesty of the church. I do not go to church now, except when I'm invited to speak and I'm often invited to speak in churches. Okay. 
Any other questions at all? Anybody have questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, what are the thoughts on post war? Because like, during the war ended, the end of the century, what are the thoughts on that? Uh, somebody just would like you maybe to comment about like right after the war ended as everybody was, you know, be kind of being coming to, you know, coming out of hiding. Uh, what was, you know, Poland like? What were your thoughts about that? I mean, that's when you were going to a Catholic school, but. Uh, no, no, this was before. I mean, when the war ended, I wasn't going to school when the war ended. I was going, I was at, I was with the nuns until the war ended. And then eventually, probably late 1945, because it ended in the spring, um, I, I, I was brought back to my father and we settled in Bielsko at that point, Warsaw or, or Poland was not at war. At, at war. Um, what was it like? I don't remember what it was like. I have no personal memory, but if you look at what you're seeing on, on, on the television now about Ukraine, you see what state Poland was in. Warsaw was 85% destroyed. The country was a disaster. And if you go to Warsaw today, if some of you have been lucky enough to travel and to go there, the city is totally rebuilt. And it's not today. It was rebuilt very closely after the war. It was rebuilt with foreign money, but it was still re rebuilt. And even the old town is rebuilt from the records that they had from aerial photographs and architectural designs that they had from before the war. It looks authentically old, which it is not. It is only as old as the early 1950s. But it must have been what you see on television now. It's very easy to, to, to visualize what it looked like. You know, burnt out buildings, bombed out buildings. Uh, you know, we were, we were horrified to see what, what happened. And we are horrified to see what's happening in, in, in Ukraine. And this is what happened in Poland. This is war. This is, this is tragic. This is genocide. Any other questions or comments? Jacob? Uh, one student wants to know how what, was it difficult to start embracing Judaism as you know when you're when you were young. You mean? Yeah. You know, like you know, once you got to Montreal and you and you started becoming a Jew, was that was it difficult? Was that was that a difficult transition? I think it was really personally difficult because I had a different identity than I thought I had had. Um, in terms of of being a, a person who's observant, I never was, and my family never was. My father and my stepmother emerged from the war, not being believers and not being practicing. We're really more we were really more culturally Jewish than we were in any sense religiously Jewish. Um, today, I do belong to a synagogue. I belong to a Reform synagogue. I feel very much a part of the Jewish community, uh, but it took many years, as I said, and. Um, I spent many years working in various institutions within the Jewish community, both as a volunteer and as a paid worker. I was a principal of a Jewish day school. I mean, it's really quite curious that I spent most of my working life um, within the, the Jewish communal institutions. I also worked at Vanier in Condet for several years. Oh, <laughs> what, what, uh, what program what were you teaching? Early childhood. Or each other. <laughs> uh, any other questions or anything like that? Okay, I think we've come to our end here. We like to, I'd like to thank you very much. It was an honor having you here and telling us your story, sharing your story with us. As you said uh, just you know a few moments ago, you know this is one of the last generations that will be able to hear you know these stories firsthand. It is the last generation because as old as I am, I am one of the youngest survivors. So it's, it's, it really is the last generation. That's it, you know, but at least uh, many of these memories are been put down to been written down or captured on, on film. Absolutely. So we have at the museum, we have close to a thousand testimonies on videotape and we are now embarking on uh, the Shoah Foundation has has, uh, has been using um, a camera, which is a 360 degree camera. And I traveled with them two years ago, just before COVID to Poland and we did some filming with that camera. And the images are very different and very powerful. Um, there's also um, holograms 
and that's a new te a new technique, a new a new um, technology that is being that it has been developed and that is being perfected mostly by the Shoah Foundation. It's extremely expensive. We in Montreal now have one hologram done, which we paid for our museum here together with the Human Rights Museum in Winnipeg, and it's a it's a testimony in French. And what that means is that the the survivor is recorded in a specially equipped studio um, with cameras that are surrounding him from every angle. And that image is programmed with about a thousand questions, which are most commonly asked about a testimony. And um, even after the demise, after the death of that survivor, uh, people can see it and the person is animated as if they were alive and they're answering questions as if they were alive. And Sometimes you have to ask the questions a certain way or you don't get the right answer. So they're perfecting it still, but this is the new technology. And um, uh, like all new technologies, it's very, very expensive now, but it will get cheaper as it's perfected. So these stories will live on in one form or the other. Um, this is really just in the nick of time because uh, most of us are, are kind of certainly in the last inning of our lives. Well, it was a pleasure having you here and hearing your story. Thank you Thanks very sir. much.